Good morning and welcome to today's professional development on writing, anchored learning through writing. I'm Valerie Cagle and it's my pleasure to present today with Aaron Johnson and Victoria Nuss. We'd like to leave our emails here for you in case you have questions after the sessions or um, just need clarification on anything. So today guys we're going to have uh, three sessions. This is session one. It might take you between 30 and 45 minutes to complete um, and we're going to go over the why and the how of incorporating writing more intentionally here at Farragut High School. So that's session one and it's just this video presentation. Session two then you need to get with your departments and as we did with PLCs we're going to be able to develop some norms for incorporating writing. We don't want you to feel like and the admin team doesn't want you to feel like that this is some kind of mandate or checklist or anything like that. But we know, just like PLCs, writing is best practice to incorporate. It also makes sense in a digital or virtual environment as well. So again, with your colleagues in your department, you're going to come up with some content-specific strategies that you can incorporate a little bit uh, in terms of writing. So that's session two. And for session two, you all need to eat, meet either in my Microsoft Teams or um, in person. And then session three is going to be another video presentation and this is by Dr. Victoria Nuss and she's going to go over, okay, now how do we incorporate those strategies into Canvas? And her presentation is very short. She's just sharing a few things with you and then giving you time to work, collaborate, and start filling out your can Canvas and being a little more intentional about including some writing. Please know that we understand there could be some apprehension if you are not an English teacher. This is not a recruiting session to make you English teachers. Um, but we want to try to show that writing will enhance your instruction rather than detract from it. And more than that, it will boost kids' performance in your content area. Who better than Abraham Lincoln to inspire us um, in terms of writing? He said, writing, the art of communicating thoughts to the mind through the eye, is the great invention of the world. Great is the astonishing range of analysis and combination, and great not only in its direct benefits, but greatest help to all other inventions. So we want to try to show you some of the benefits of writing in your class today. Before we start, I'd like for you to take this opportunity maybe to pause the video if you're with others, you can turn and talk about these three questions, or you might want to jot down your own ideas and, and discuss um, later with your PLCs or um, with those who are with you. So there are three questions here before we get started. Why are effective writing skills essential to your class? What are your concerns about asking students to write in your class? And how might these concerns be eliminated? So take just a minute to pause, reflect, and write or discuss. So as Valerie said, uh, you know, this isn't new. You've had some time to think about how this has occurred at Farragut before as well. Um, and we know that this is uh, something that most of us try to do. But just like with PLCs, if we're not in the practice of doing it, or we're not as intentional about incorporating it, maybe in some other disciplines, you know, it's, it's not as uh, prevalent in our instruction as it could be. So the why, as Dr. Bartlett had us reflect upon earlier this week, is important. And we know that writing is um, something that's very essential for student success long term. And also, it makes a lot of sense in a virtual environment. Many of us are concerned about students uh, cheating, even if they realize don't realize that it's cheating. That's very prevalent, as we know, in online instruction because there are so many resources available to them and there isn't a teacher necessarily hovering over them uh, as they're doing work. So it's very easy and tempting for them um, to cheat and so forth. So writing gives a little more accountability, but it also is instructionally and pedagogically significant. It allows us to reflect, it allows us to process, and it's you know, it's one of those rigorous activities that we can incorporate, especially in a virtual environment. 
So we really know the why as teachers, but we have tended to neglect writing. And I can say that even as an English teacher, um, I can see places where I have missed opportunities for my kids to write. In 2003, the National Commission on Writing produced a report called The Need for a Writing Revolution, The Neglected R. So we think about the basics of education being the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Um, but this report brought to light some concerns about, um, as I said, missed opportunities to write. So it said, American education will never realize its potential as an engine of opportunity and economic growth until a writing revolution puts language and communication in their proper place in the classroom. Of the three R's, writing is clearly the most neglected. So because of that uh, National Commission report in 2003, in 2017, a book was released called The Writing Revolution, A Guide to Balancing Thinking, sorry, A Guide to Advancing Thinking Through Writing in All Subjects and Grades. And this is a book that I first was introduced to last summer at pre-AP training. So a lot of the pre-AP writing um, comes from strategies in this book. And we also learned that Dr. Bartlett and the administrators in Knox County received a copy of this book as well. So take a minute to look at this quote, and particularly what I've underlined here from The Writing Revolution. Um, Hockman, one of the writers, said, If I could wave a magic wand over America's schools and cause one change that would drive the most demonstrable improvement to learning and achievement, I would certainly wave that wand and conjure up small bursts of intense, reflective, high-quality writing in every class period or every hour. So the book, The Writing Revolution, is based on uh, six principles, but I wanted to pull out and focus on the two that really affect us most, regardless of what grade we teach or what subject. And the first is, when embedded in the content of curriculum, writing instruction is a powerful teaching tool. And as Aaron said, it's going to be even more powerful um, for those of us who are teaching virtually. There are two reasons for that. Uh, first of all, it enhances students' thinking and it can enhance the learning of content. After all, you can't write well about something you don't know well. So please remember the strategies that we're going to give you today are introduced after you have shared and given kids access to content. And so that second principle on the screen says the content of the curriculum drives the rigor of the activities, um, of the writing activities. So when we show you some of these strategies, they may seem simplistic at first, but remember this is a way not only to get kids writing and give them kind of a rough start for writing, but to, to bring in that content that is, again, going to drive the rigor. So those of you who have taught for a while, and especially at Farragut, we want to kind of pull back for a second and ask, okay, so writing revolution, is that really what this is? Is this anything new? Well, where are we? Is it a writing revolution or is it really more of a renaissance for Farragut? So take a minute to reflect on your past experiences at Farragut High School or other schools with writing across the curriculum. This might be an opportunity to pause the video and talk with others or just gather your own thoughts. So the good news is, writing is thinking. So we are already doing this. When we look at the quotes here, um, they kind of express through different writers this idea that writing is thinking and a process, as Aaron talked about earlier. So the first quote says, how do I know what I think until I see what I say? Joan Didion said, I don't know what I think until I write it down. And one of my favorites, Southern writer Flannery O'Connor said, I write because I don't know what I think until I read what I say. So again, that process of writing to learn. So again, good news here. When we ask students to think, we can ask them to write instead. 
when we ask students what they think, we can ask them to write. So rather than having them discuss immediately, have them pause. Take a minute to write down their thoughts. For those introverts out there, myself included, we need that opportunity to gather our thoughts, write them down to sort it out for ourselves, but also to have something to bring to the table. So there's a distinction that we want to make between writing to learn versus learning to write. And please think of this as process, a continuum. So if we're really focusing on the writing to learn, the purpose there is simply to think, to aid students in thinking through the content. There's an emphasis on content. These would be informal, often ungraded pieces um, in the link, or sorry, not the Lincoln quote, but in the quote that I shared earlier from the neglected R. It talks about these small bursts of writing. That's what writing to learn is. Learning to write is where probably English teachers live more. Um, this is for the purpose of communicating, but any teacher can offer writing where you're teaching them in your discipline what a good writer is like in science, what is a good writer like in engineering or in business. And so these might lead to the formal polished pieces that a student would submit for a grade. This pyramid of writing priorities um, really, I think, is going to be my go-to for planning writing instruction in my own class. It came from Dave Stewart Jr.'s book called These Six Things, and I highly recommend it. But he talks about three levels of writing, three types of writing that are based on purposes and frequency. And at the lower level of this pyramid, we have provisional writing. And this would be the learning, or sorry, the writing to learn, um, kinds of writing. Brief writing that's supporting learning like quick writes, tickets in, bell ringers, warm-ups, exit tickets. This should be happening daily. So within a lesson, maybe a couple of times within a lesson. Whenever new content is introduced, kids need that provisional writing to let it sink in and to work through it. Then as we move up the pyramid, we have readable writing. And this is probably where most of our kids um, will be with college writing. The clarified, organized thinking that is offered in on-demand essays or responses. So these could be weekly assignments, um, short answer questions, on quizzes, on tests. Those would all fall under readable writing as well, including timed writing and class essays. What we want to work up to is getting better at the polished writing. And that is the, the pinnacle here of the pyramid. It's improved writing through an extended writing or revision process. So this is going to take us all the way to the revision process. Not that it will ever be perfect, but it will be as perfect as it can be by the deadline. And it's, it's certainly worthy of your time to have students revisit what they have written and turned in for the purpose of improving it. So Valerie has discussed um, where we're getting some of this information and kind of why we're charged with being a little more intentional uh, in the coming years about incorporating writing and getting back to that. So that's, that's our why, and we, we know that it is good practice to do so. So now we're going to get a little bit into the how, and partly with this we're going to need your help as well because we need to know what... Uh, and we're going to collaborate as departments and share with each other a little bit about what writing needs to look like for you in a business class or in science and so forth. And it can be helpful for us to kind of support each other and get out of our wings a little bit and um, realize what, what's beneficial for the other disciplines as well. So writing is firstly, and this seems somewhat self-evident, but writing is first a form of communication. Uh, sometimes I have to tell students, even if you have a very strong command of grammar uh, and a strong writer and so forth, if you have a, a word explosion on the page and I read it and I can't really understand what it is you're trying to say, that is not effective writing for me. I need you to be clear and, I, and your writing needs to be easily understood. And that will vary a little bit from context to context. But as Valerie said, and many of us know, friends who have progressed in their careers, let's say engineering, 
right? There's a lot of math and science up front, but as you progress in your career, it becomes a lot of communication, a lot of people management. And I've heard from friends that sometimes the people that they're getting in to these administrative positions are not great communicators, they're not great writers, et cetera. So regardless of the field or discipline that our students are going to go into, they need to be able to communicate well. They need to be able to write well, and they need to obviously be able to process their thinking in a way that's constructive and that uses evidence. So that's kind of where we're going. According to the text that we're using, there are four types of writing. Expository, narrative, descriptive, and argumentative. We're not going to spend a lot of time on these, um, but we are just going to briefly kind of cover them. And the point is to get you thinking about, okay, I'm a science teacher. What do I want to incorporate in, as a part of my writing in my classroom? What types of writing can I bring in? And so forth. Expository is sometimes called informative writing. We see this a lot. It's writing that explains and informs. Um, think textbooks. I think of it as kind of objective writing. Uh, newspaper articles, not opinion pieces, but just kind of explaining what happened. Instruction manuals, etc. These are examples of expository writing. Dr. Bartlett referenced narrative in his opening remarks. He talked about you know, students using technology in order to solve math problems, right? Or to kind of cheat on math problems. So rather than having them, you know, giving them the problem that they're able to take a picture of and get the answer, have them narrate how they solve that math problem. And that's what that's a very appropriate use of the word narrative. Sequential order, chronological order, it's describing and narrating things in sequence. Sometimes we talk about a story as being a narrative, right? Because we're telling something in a certain sequence. And this can be very useful in math, science, etc. Descriptive writing as well. And I'm not going to spend much time on this. This is one we're probably very familiar with. Think the senses, right? Descriptive writing, adjectives, describe the room you're in, etc. The one I spend the most time on is argumentative with my students, and many experts think that this is the most cognitively demanding form of writing, and I would have to agree with them, because students not only have to be able to, say, read a nonfiction, uh, nonfiction article, they have to understand what that article is about, but then they have to make an argument about that article. They have to draft a thesis statement about that article and say what that article means to them or what they think that article is about. Uh, I tell students, you know, you don't need to tell me what's in a story. I've read the story. I need to know what you think about the story. Therefore, I need you to make an argument. But not only do I need you to do that, I need you to back it up with evidence. Uh, that's a trend in education, what we call like text-dependent questions and, that, and so forth, where students are required to engage with text regardless of discipline, and we need to craft our questions and do our questioning such that they have to engage the text and they have to use that text as evidence. Again, regardless of discipline, and this holds the students accountable. Rigor. Valerie referenced the three R's of education, writing, reading, and arithmetic, and that's something that's been said many, many, many times. I was in a professional development, and I had a state, state superintendent speak to us, and he said, the new three R's of education are rigor, relevance, and relationships. And I processed that, and I kind of took that in, and that kind of solidified my educational philosophy, because I agree with that. I think that everything that we do, we need to strive for rigor. In order to hook the kids in, you know, we used to talk about sets, in the old lesson lines, instructional lines, right, where you play a little video or something to get the kids interested in the learning, that's relevance. You're trying to make the learning relevant to the student. Why do I need to know this? And then the last one is relationships. And I think the push from our admin is quite clearly with the implementation of advisory, et cetera, that we need to foster and solidify our relationships with students. Well, writing is the same way. We, it needs to be rigorous. And writing is a process, and rigor often comes from that process. So here's a, an example of a writing process 
I'm not going to spend much time on this. You've seen it before. It's a familiar process to you. But basically, you need to know what it is that you want students to produce. We're not making this stuff up on the fly. We need to kind of think about it a little bit and develop a plan in advance. When I'm coaching teachers, sometimes I say, teaching boils down to know your expectations, communicate those expectations clearly, hold students accountable to those expectations. Whether it's academics or classroom management, I think that somewhat applies. So the same for writing. We need to know what we want them to produce. We need to communicate to them clearly how to go through that process, a process with benchmarks, check-ins, and so forth. And then we need to hold them accountable to those expectations. Well, what accountability could mean in writing is you give them feedback. Do they do anything with it? Or does it just sit there? Do they just get their grade and they're done? Or do they incorporate your feedback to some degree? A quick fix for that might be 80% up front, 20% after revisions, meaning they are required to use your feedback for part of their grade and make changes to their paper. Or another way of doing it is to make them reflect upon or have them reflect upon the score they were given, grade themselves, and so forth. I think too often we jump from assignment to product and kids don't have the opportunity for that second step in the writing process of pre-writing or gathering their ideas. I'm excited that um, the programs that we have at Farragut High School that we're really focusing on this year provide kids with places where writing is already built in especially pre-writing and writing. Uh, for example, the AVID strategies that we focused on for this year. <clears throat> Things like Cornell notes, learning logs, quick writes, reflections, and peer evaluation. Those are things that will give them <coughs> excuse me, something already on paper to gather their thoughts, organize their thoughts, and begin to write. They might take, for example, their Cornell notes and write a summary or a descriptive piece. Pre-AP also um, connects to one of the important principles from the writing revolution and a lot of the curriculum for writing, as I said earlier, is from the writing revolution. But the principle that pre-AP operates under is that sentences are the building blocks of writing. So we begin with sentence level practice, then we might introduce a kernel sentence and have them break it out or expand it using um, journalistic style of the who, what, when, where, why, and how. Sentence expansion and combining, sentence frames, and single paragraph outlines and multi-paragraph outlines. Once our students work through those processes of getting those ideas down, they have already pretty much mapped out a full essay. And that's exciting because this year we're doing that in English, Algebra 1, World History, and Geography. So we have those three courses that are pre-AP. And there are lots of wonderful um, strategies that pre-AP teachers have learned or will be learning that can be shared with others in your department as well. Okay, so as I said, one of the principles of the writing revolution is that sentences are the building blocks of all writing. Well, why is that? The analytical skills that are required to produce an effective sentence are not so unlike those that are required to produce an effective paragraph or an effective essay. So by learning how to connect ideas in a sentence, students are learning how to connect ideas in paragraphs. So that's where the writing or learning to write part comes in. Remember, sentences are miniature compositions and the rigor of your um, sentences will be through your content. So earlier I made a claim that effective writing skills are essential to every class. And I asked you to reflect on these three questions. And uh, what I was doing was setting you up for some pre-writing, the same way I hope you will with your students. And so I offered these three ideas in the forms of questions 
but we could also turn them around and make them sentence stems or sentence frames. So looking at question number one, why are effective writing skills essential to your class? I could have also turned that around and offered you a STEM and had you complete it with your ideas and content. So effective writing skills are essential to my class because effective writing skills are essential to my class but and finally effective writing skills are essential to my class so. I have to admit when I first saw this strategy used in pre-AP I teach honors so I thought kids are going to look at that and say oh great a fill in the blank. But what it does is kind of free up kids not to have to think about form, but focus on content. And for your kids who are struggling writers, they have sort of some training wheels to, to look at what an effective, clear sentence could look like. So here are some examples um, of using sentence frames that rely on conjunctions. And please don't get bogged down in the grammar lingo I'm about to use. That's not the point. Um, but conjunctions are joining words. And so what I just showed you was a because, but, and so sentence frame. When we look at because, that word is a subordinating conjunction that's going to explain why something is true. So I made a claim, and now they're going to provide the content of why it's true. Aaron talked earlier about making a claim and supporting it with evidence. This is where that evidence or your content comes through. The conjunction but is a coordinating conjunction that's going to indicate a change of direction. Um, so we had one thought and then I have something that contrasts that. Finally, so in that frame tells us a cause and effect relationship. So let's look at that in practice with a couple of examples. And I'm proud of myself for these examples because I broke out of my comfort zone. I didn't rely on humanities examples. So I tried to give something from outside my um, wheelhouse. So fractions are like decimals is my claim. If you look at the example on the left. So I would put that up and then I would have students respond with a because, but, and so. So fractions are like decimals because they are parts of whole. Fractions are like decimals, but they are written differently. And fractions are like decimals, so they can be used interchangeably. For your more sophisticated writers, you might give them a different frame. You might, for the second example, say, um, although they are written differently, fractions are like decimals. So they could play with the style of the sentences once they have the ideas down. Now, the example for science on the right, which I won't read to you, but this example is a little more complex. You can tell the sentences are longer because, again, the content might be more rigorous. And that's what's driving the rigor of the writing. We have some other examples of sentence frames that you are welcome to go to our drive to um, adapt to what you need. We don't want kids coming in every single day and writing a because, but, and so frame. We want to include other ideas as well. So when you go to our drive in the sentence level writing folder, um, we have some examples from math, from science, but here's one that's a little more generic that I wanted to show you. Um, it comes from a great book on writing called They Say, I Say, which is really about um, argumentative writing, but it gives you just some sentence frames um, for different occasions. So I highly recommend that one as a starting point, especially when you've had students read a text. So I've already talked about sentences, and we're going to transition a little bit to paragraphs here. And so and that's kind of mirroring the pre-AP model, right? Kind of the micro outward to macro. And that really is the best way to do things, as we know. Train them um, in something that they can handle and comprehend on a, on a smaller level at first, and then we work outward. So again, we have a QR code here that can take you into the Google Drive. And let me spend a little time in here that... Valerie talked about a second ago to show you what we're doing. This is a living drive. Valerie and I don't have all the math resources and science resources and so forth. We're English teachers. 
but you guys do. Uh, and some of the people who are new to our building, they need some help. Uh, even if they're not new to teaching, they need some resources. And some of our veteran teachers may not be as comfortable transitioning to online learning or virtual learning. And, and some of our new teachers won't be comfortable with that because a lot of their instruction in college has been about in-person teaching or whatever. So we all need to work with each other and help each other out the best we can. So if you have anything from science, from art history or whatever that will be beneficial to others, please share it. So that was the sentence level writing that Valerie, I'm going to show you the paragraph writing and we're going to add to it and please you as well. There are some examples in here from the text of frames for paragraphs. Emphasis on topic sentence, evidence, concluding sentence, and so forth. But I'm going to show you a couple of other examples. Here's another one. It's a little bit similar, but just different language. And the language needs to be appropriate for your context. This is an activity I use every year when I teach AP Language and Composition. It's called a rhetorical praise. And as the name might indicate, it's teaching students to be precise, and concise in their writing. It's a rigorous paragraph. It's only four sentences. So this whole worksheet is devoted to them learning how to write four sentences. But this very much mirrors, from my understanding, kind of the pre-AP model too. Because we're starting small and then I extrapolate from here and they end up writing multi-page rhetorical analyses from this. But it's basically teaching them to read an article, a nonfiction article for instance, or an, a newspaper article, and then they write four sentences about that article. But they're four very specific sentences that serve very specific purpose. And then there's a frame, just like with Valerie's sentence frames that you can use, and, and there's, it's coded with where they can add nouns and verbs that are appropriate or significant, and they're basically learning how to write one paragraph where they tell me very critically, after they do some critical thinking and critical analysis, what this article is about. And then down at the bottom, there's an example, pray see. And then I simply grade it with a rubric. And so the grading is not at all difficult, but the activity is very rigorous. So if it's five sentences, they lose points. It's, it's only supposed to be four sentences. Teach your students, obviously, which we know they need help with, even AP students, following directions and so forth. Here's another one. This may be useful to all of us, regardless of our content area, especially if we go virtual, but even face-to-face. -face. I, I use this every year. I use it last year. Uh, this isn't my assignment. I, I received it from another teacher. But it's basically having the students write an email introduction of themselves and their families to me, the teacher, to their grade-level principal, and their counselor. And what that does, it does a lot of things, but it, it, it is a rigorous assignment. A lot of students aren't great at formal writing. Uh, I've joked with a colleague the other morning, she was saying that she gets rather terse emails from students from time to time, right? Like, what's the assignment tonight? Um, and that we need to kind of teach them a little bit of professionalism and that emails are not long form text messages, but rather they're digital letters. So we have to teach them about salutations and about greetings because they don't really know that because they haven't been taught to write letters necessarily in our current cultural context. So anyway, this is an email introductory assignment. They describe themselves and they're, you know, are they new to Farragut and so forth, a little bit about their families, and they send it to us. And that's a way of me getting to know my students, the principal, the counselor, obviously get their permission in advance before we flood their inboxes with a bunch of emails. But in, in the past, they've enjoyed that because they get a sense of who the student is. Student gets practice with formal writing and rigor. And then also, it has the added bonus of establishing that communication, right? My email address is now a part of their inbox, as is theirs. And so if I type in their name, their email comes up right away. And we've already established that line of communication. So if we go virtual, to me, that assignment makes a lot of sense. So. The point is, writing will look different context to context. Having a framework, as Valerie said, sentence frame, paragraph frame, start small, and then get bigger from there in your assignments. That's kind of a beneficial way to approach writing.
and it mirrors the PAP and AP models. Another thing that the text emphasizes are some just stylistic things about writing to emphasize transitions, building bridges between ideas, creating flow. We're not trying to turn you into English teachers, but these are just aspects, regardless of discipline, that are good practice. And there are, for each of these, there are documents in the shared Google Drive that you can explore later. Revising versus editing, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. They are different. Editing, think Grammarly, right? Which I encourage everybody to have your students install the free version on Google Chrome as an extension. I use it every day as an English teacher because we're super insecure when we send an email about making a grammatical mistake because then everybody judges us because we're English teachers. Grammarly is amazing, but that's editing. Revising requires feedback. And I tell students, you know, grammar is usually right or wrong, right? Usually a comma goes there or it doesn't, whereas style is strong versus weak. And that's something that they need coaching about. So they need coaching in the revising arena to then incorporate feedback into their writing and improve it. Now, and that'll vary, right, from business to science to English, what good writing looks like. My wife and I have taken a class with Dave Ramsey. I'm a big fan of his. I listen to his podcast. If you don't know him, he's a UTK alum, Tennessee native, who went through bankruptcy in his early days um, and then now has a multi-million dollar company and reaches a lot of people basically with the principle of no debt. Uh, I wish all students had to take this before they went to college and you know, got a credit card to sign up for a subway, free Subway sandwich or something. Um, so it's, it's very useful information, but he, he, Dave is funny and he says that he has a PhD in dumb. And what he means by that is he's made the mistakes himself that he's now coaching uh, people to not make. So he's been there. Well, I could say that I have a PhD in dumb when it comes to writing. And many English teachers do, and here's what we do wrong. We assign all of our sections a paper. We have them all due at the same time. We now have a hundred papers sitting on our desk. And we are overwhelmed by the idea of adding feedback to all these papers, grading all these papers. It takes hours and hours, and then we hand them all back to them or submit them back to them virtually, whatever the case may be. What do the students do? Check the grade, boom, they're done, right? We've spent hours working on them, and they may not even incorporate or look at the feedback. What's helped me in my writing, and I know other English teachers as well, is to differentiate between these two. Feedback is process. Feedback can occur at those benchmarks that we talked about earlier in the writing process. They do not have to come when the paper is due. When a student submits me a final draft of a paper, I'll often make two, three comments that they need to think about, things I want them to work on, and that's it. And then I put a grade on it with a rubric. That's, that's, that's the turn-in part. But the feedback is a process throughout. So if they give me a draft, then I can make some edits on it or make some suggestions that they need to change. Then they go back and revise their draft, work on it, incorporate my feedback. That's where it happens in the process. And I've lately tried to incorporate that as much as possible in class, and I do it with a shared Google Drive. So the student and myself pull up the document at the same time, and we look at it together in real time, and they can see me going through the document and making changes or suggestions. So feedback can happen as a process. Grading happens at the end. Don't earn a PhD in dumb as I have done and overwhelm yourselves. And again, you don't have to make them write whole papers. This could be for a paragraph. So you've seen our Google Drive. We've explored it with you a little bit. And you know that we have a lot of resources for you in there. But we also need you guys to add resources that will be useful to your colleagues. Um, you know, math resources, science resources, art resources, whatever you think is beneficial. And it will also allow us to see what does writing look like in these different disciplines because then we can start supporting one another uh, and helping these students ultimately for their future careers, which is the most important thing. And our most important task is to kind of get them ready for what's ahead of them. And we know that writing and communicating is a big part of that regardless of what you go into. And just another word about resources, these can be adapted to any level. Um, there's a song that I love by you 2 called Get Out of Your Own Way. And I think sometimes a lot of our kids hide 
behind their words. So if we can get them to focus just on the content and get out of their own way, don't let their ideas get lost in the words, but provide them with those frames for sentences and paragraphs, then they can break out and make it their own and, and let their voice come through. So we appreciate your time this morning. This is the end of session one. For session two, you're gonna be meeting uh, with your department, either in person or via Microsoft Teams. At the end of this session, you will be submitting an analysis form, one per department, to the admin team. And we have a, a folder in our Google Drive where you're just gonna drop that in and, and show us what your plan of action will be for writing within your department or your classes. So up next is session two, and we appreciate your time. Thank you.